Christ together. Not splattered all over the place, but here together. Paul really asks the question of the Corinthian church, really, why are you even doing this? Now, the question isn't actually articulated, but it's implied. And he reminds them. In fact, he says this, he goes, you have houses to eat, and do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame others who have nothing, which is his way of saying who are different. What he's talking about is us coming together. All one at the table of the Lord. Then he goes on to give them this brief instruction which we many times use some of the best instruction we ever get from God comes out of the worst moments of our lives. When we're doing everything wrong, or at least think we are, when everything seems to be going the wrong direction, but it's not really, when it appears that nothing's happening, but Something is always happening in God's kingdom. And we get this great instruction out of this really negative moment in the church. I received from the Lord that which I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Let's do that. I'm always challenged by these little cups. If, like me, you're still working on it, just keep working on it. I'll get there with you. He took the bread, and he broke it. Would you do that with me? Just snap that in two. It's pretty easy to do with these. They've been around a while. And he said, this is my body. Now, we know it's not literally the body of Christ, but it represents his body for us. Which is... For you, do this in remembrance of me. And we know that Jesus gave it to the disciples and they ate. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper. Which, by the way, implies that there was more to eat than just that little wafer. After supper... He took the cup. Have you got it open yet? I'm now wearing some on my thumb. And Paul recounting what Jesus said. Jesus said this cup is a new covenant in my blood. And in a little bit I'm going to talk a bit about covenant. A covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. Remember me. Lord, may we remember you even now. Paul then adds comment. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. All the great teachers and preachers of Scripture will tell you that everything we do pivots around the atonement, around the cross of Christ, around his death and resurrection. Everything coming up to his death and resurrection from the Old Testament points to that event. And everything we do since that time looks back to that event. The pivot point, the hinge of all history 
is Christ's death on a cross and his resurrection. So Paul says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. In other words, if you do it just because, eh, it's what we do. Or if you do it and don't know what it means. Well, I didn't dismiss you yet, but I guess you can go. I was trying to figure out what had happened, and it dawned on me that when you do this, you bring judgment on yourself. And by the way, we as believers, when we do this, perfunctorily, we bring judgment on God's church as well, because the world looks at us and goes, ah, just going through the motions, are we? Let it be real to us. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Amen. Okay. So there's a uh, movie that wandered through my brain while I was working on this message. (laughs) I never cared for the movie that much. I think my wife liked it a lot. She's mentioned it from time to time. What about Bob? You remember that? Anybody? What about Bob? Yeah. Well, the only reason I thought of it is because I had written this message and rewritten it and rewritten it and kept rewriting it. And Friday night I went to sleep and somewhere in the middle of the night woke up and went, so what about God? And I went, oh, no, it reminded me of that dumb movie. You ever thought about God? Of course you have. Silly question. But how have you ever even come to think about God? Where did you ever get such a thought as God? You ever ask yourself that? Walking down the street one day and you went, I think I'll think about God. Really? There's some other questions that come along behind that, like, well, is there really a God out there? And what is he, she, it, they like? I used to teach comparative religions. There's a lot of religious systems out there that have variations on all of those themes. How many are there? What do they do? Where do they dwell? Or does he dwell? Or it dwell? Or whatever God is, you know, where does he hang out? Well, we learn as children. Our parents and others give us early ideas about God. And our interaction with what we are taught and what we experience shape our thoughts about God. And some philosophers have said that If we were not influenced by the environment, we would not believe in God because somebody told us about God, and that's why we think about it. But we are born in a world of ideas and thought. We're not born into a vacuum. Someone had an idea, and they passed on their experience to the succeeding generations of mankind. You see, every time we try to blame something on the environment, we end up with this little problem. Uh, People say, well, children wouldn't be wicked if they hadn't learned wickedness from their parents. Okay, I'll go along with you that far. Where did our parents learn to be sinful? From their parents. Well, where did they learn to be sinful? From their parents. And where did, you see where this goes. You walk back far enough, you know where you end up? In the Garden of Eden with Adam. And all we've done is just verified what God's Word said already. We are born in sin. And finding some way to try to shift the blame or explain it away always brings us back to the fundamental truth of God's Word. Divine and human interaction began somewhere at some time, and so... Here's the truth of it. The reason we think about God is we are, in the words of one philosopher, incurably religious. 
There is a God-shaped spot inside every one of us that must be filled with something or someone. The fact that you can think of God establishes the possibility of his existence. Whoa, wait, did you catch that? The fact that you can think of God establishes the possibility of his existence. The fact that your finite mind can think of something so far beyond your finiteness implies that there is a God. So what about God? Well, I've heard God... Uh, there's, there's this little story about dial of prayer. Anybody ever used dial of prayer? It actually is a thing. There, there, at least it used to be. You could call this 1-800 number and, and, and there'd be a prayer that you could hear. I heard a guy say one time that for the theist, that's people who believe in God, we, we would call dial of prayer and, and we'd, we'd get answers. We'd get help. If a deist were to call dial of prayer... Uh, the message would be, work this out for yourself. That's what deists think. God set up the world and started it running and said, here, go play with it. Figure it out. The agnostics, they would call dial a prayer and the line would always be busy. God's there, but he's not available. For the atheists, they call and there's no answer. Each of us has an idea of what we will discover when we ask that question, what about God? The Bible tells us about the nature, the work, and purpose of God. It reveals his relationship to us and to his creation, which includes us. It lays out for us how we shall live. Indeed, the Bible tells us who first taught us about God. His name was Adam. People sometimes kind of miss this because they want to create kind of a mythology around the Genesis account in the Garden of Eden. Now, you can look at that passage of Scripture and say it's metaphorical or it's allegorical or you can fill in whatever, you know, nice little adjective you want to give to that passage. But I'm a little more simplistic. I think it's pretty much what we read. Kind of like a Joe Friday version of the scripture. Just the facts, ma'am. Adam told his kids about the garden. Eve told her daughters about the garden. And they told their kids, and they told their kids. And if you did a timeline on the age of man, you would find that, the, that Noah was born just less than, uh, just about one generation after Adam died. So what we have is a first-hand account. We don't have millennia of storytelling. We have literally fresh off the press news about what happened when God created man and man fell. Adam knew God personally and he shared with us what happened. The Bible's an instruction manual on every aspect of life and living and all of the great questions that we ask about life and living. Like what is truth and what is good and what is right? The great questions of the philosophers. And the answers of Holy Scripture offer us the only answers that fit our questions. Let me back that up. Holy Scripture is the only source that answers adequately, sufficiently, completely, the questions that we ask. C.S. Lewis made that observation. By the way, he started his journey of faith out of a position of agnosticism at the best, atheism at the worst. He didn't really believe there was a God, wasn't too interested in God, and was given the challenge, well, prove that there is no God. And so he set out intellectually to prove that there was no God and ended up going, wow. There's not only a God, he's the only one that makes sense out of any of this stuff. Under the inspiration of God's Spirit, 
David wrote to us in the text I'm going to use today from Psalm 19. And in this text, there are six unchanging truths about God and our relationship with him that I want to talk about. I really want to read to you the whole passage. If you'd like to turn to Psalm 19, if you happen to have that on your digital device or in a more archaic form like a book, um, <laughs> I get teased about my Bible because it's held together with packing tape. I just can't quite let go of it. Here's what David writes. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth, pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the earth. And in them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It, is, it rises from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of them. There's nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, and they are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? And Lord, acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not rule over me then I shall be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Six unchangeable truths. One, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Two, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Three, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Number four, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Five, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Six, the judgments of the Lord are true, and they are righteous altogether. What about God? Well, he's told us everything we really need to know about him in this book that we call the Bible. I read a headline this last week. Argentina's government is collapsing. People refuse to work. And major subsidies are being cut. 22 years of government subsidies, according to the article. Argentina has been subsidizing its working population to the tune of six million dollars a day. Fifty-seven percent of the country are unemployed. Well, if you're going to pay me to not work, do you think I'm going to go to work? Of course not. Yeah, we kind of have had a little taste of that here, haven't we? The government's collapsing from unsustainable spending, said one financial expert in the government. Leaders who supported subsidies are now asking people to go to work to save the country. In fact, the vice president, who has been president of the country in the past, I don't know how that works, but she'd been president, now she's vice president, and her name is Kirchner, which doesn't sound too Argentine to me, but, well, I understand a lot of the German folk moved there right after World War II. Protests have broken out, demanding subsidies not only be kept, but be increased. 
There's a guy named Alvarez Gomez. Happens to be a taxi cab driver in the city of Buenos Aires. He's been working there for 15 years, and he was interviewed, you know, kind of a man on the street interview. This is madness. Half of our country doesn't want a job, and the ones who do don't want to pay taxes for the ones who don't. I can relate to that. One outraged woman says, the government expects us to work from 8 to 5 for the same amount of money. Okay. She was asked, well, how did you support your family before this? The government. Subsidies. Another protester said, Christina Kirchner, our vice president, told us we had to go to work instead of receiving social benefits. Going to work is a policy of a right-winger. You can't make this stuff up. Meanwhile, their president is asking for unity. Good politician, I appreciate that. Why am I even bringing that up? How does that tie to Psalm 19? I'm going to show you in just a moment. Paul, writing in Romans chapter 1, starting at about verse 18, makes some rather insightful comments about the nature of sin. He says that since the beginning of creation, God has openly displayed his will and his way that all creation works to reveal him. That parallels Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. Paul basically reiterates what David said, oh, I don't know about 1,200 years earlier. Paul goes on to say that man, in his arrogance, has deemed himself smarter than his creator. Wiser than his creator. More clever than his creator. Do you ever think how stupid that actually is? And I, just, I use stupid advisedly because if you were in a, uh, a contest with somebody that was twice your size and five times stronger than you, they'd look at you and laugh. And the Bible says that's exactly what God does, is he laughs at the arrogance of man. <laughs> I have a visual image of that that just kind of cracks me up every time I see it. Paul says, man in his arrogance deemed himself wiser than his creator, and the result is that the knowledge of, he has knowledge of God. What about God? Yeah, we know he's there. But he no longer honors him as God. And there are a lot of people, even in the church, that do that. You believe in Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, then how come you don't live like you do? Well, I, I, I believe in him, but I don't believe in him. You get that, right? I intellectually assent that there is a God out there, but I don't think I want to listen to anything he has to say to me about how I'm living. Can I tell you that every time we adopt that position, even we who have been trying to follow the Lord for a lot of years... We get in a situation where we are tempted to do something that we know God's word says we shouldn't do. And we start thinking, well, I think I can work my way around this with the Lord. As soon as we do that, Paul says, deeming ourselves to be wise, we have become fools. And out of that foolishness, out of this rebellion, out of this decision to not obey what God has taught us and revealed to us in his word and in his very creation itself, for those people who always say, oh, I just don't understand the Bible, then go outside and look at the world he's created. Solomon said, hey, you lazy bums that don't want to work, go out and look at the ant. They'll teach you something about work and the benefit of it. By the way, you know what God's answer is to uh, subsidies? Not a very popular answer. Two things. He who doesn't work shouldn't eat. The other one is, 
the one who does not take care of their own family is worse than an unbeliever. And Paul said that to the church. It's not popular. It sounds intolerant. But it's the truth. And the kindest thing we can do for one another is remind each other of God's truth and encourage each other to the good works that come out of obedience to the truth. Not to the convenience of politically correct thinking. But a commitment to the truth. Paul said, because of this arrogance, it has brought corruption to our minds, our bodies, our spirit, and yes, our environment. God's truth, he said, has been lost in exchange for men's lies. Therefore, his judgment is being poured out on every person and every nation that has ignored and or forgotten him. He says that sin has literally darkened our foolish hearts and made our thinking futile. You can use a lot of other words in place of futile. Dumb. Waste of time. Silly. Foolish. Crazy. Thinking outside of God's directives is a bad idea. What Paul's saying. Professing to be wise, having become fools, God's judgment comes upon us. It's not malicious judgment. Some people have this vision of God walking around with a big stick, just waiting. Ah, I saw that. <laughs> no. God has set up his worlds, his universe, his cosmos, this earth, to follow spiritual laws and natural laws. When we follow them, there's blessing. When we don't follow them, it hurts us. God doesn't go out of his way to smack us around. It, if it happens to us, it's because we've done it to ourselves. It doesn't take much imagination to see that what Paul wrote 2,000 years ago, roughly, is coming true as we watch the news and listen to the thought leaders of today. Every once in a while, I read something that I think had to been written by somebody who completely lost their mind. But there's good news. It's not too late for us to embrace the truth of God's word for ourselves. And like Joshua did in his day before he went into the promised land to take it over, he made a declaration of faith, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if we do serve the Lord, as Joshua did, guess what? We're going to get to the end of the promised land. And the promised land isn't someday in the sweet by and by. It's right here and now. We get a little bit of heaven to go to heaven in. People say, wow, really? In this world? Yeah. Paul lived in a much worse time than we did. And he enjoyed being a part of the kingdom of heaven, even as he walked through persecution of all kinds. And we can too. So Psalm 19, all that to lay this out, these six ideas. The Bible is full of a lot more than this, but I only get this amount of time today, whatever that is, so I'm only going to deal with six, and I'll do them pretty quick. These six principles essentially speak to how to live your life, what about God, how are we supposed to be successful in this world that we're living in? What comes out of that? And honestly, I don't figure that you'll remember all six of these, but maybe there will be one, one thing in here that the Holy Spirit will encourage you with, and it will become important to your life this next week, or maybe even this next year. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Verse 7 out of Psalm 19. What this is saying is, is that God's instructions for living, his directions for life, his teachings on life are complete and whole. Nothing lacking. 
they are secure, they are sound. And they will always be moral. Humanism is out there challenging this, saying, oh, it's immoral for us to have this attitude about, and you fill in the blank, whatever it might be. But here's the reality of it. If God's word says that something is sin, it is sin. And you're not being kind and tolerant by saying, oh, it's okay that you believe in that. It's all right. You just go ahead and believe that sin. That's not moral. That's immoral. The greatest expression of love that we can have for another human being is to, without malice or vengeance, but in a gentle and kind spirit, be able to say to them, what you are doing will destroy you. A number of years ago, I was pastoring up in Yakima, and uh, I had a young man start coming to my church. It turned out that uh, he was coming because there was a woman in our church that he was quite enamored by, and they had developed a relationship. She was married. He was divorced. And he wanted to pursue that relationship, so he started attending our church, and after a while I found out about this. And I began to meet with him and try to help him understand that the direction he was headed was not good. She figured out that she was headed the wrong direction, repented of it, straightened out her marriage, abandoned this relationship. But this young man wouldn't let go of her. Basically, he was trying to hang on to her. And I remember him meeting with me one day and saying, if I can't have her, I'd rather be dead. And I said, if you can't change your attitude, you're going to be dead and in hell. He said, then I'd rather be in hell than be here without her. And I remember saying to him, I said, Dean... Think about what you're saying. Because at the rate you're going, you're going to destroy yourself. Four months later, I told them where to find his body. Because he had told me once, if I can't have her, I'm going to kill myself. One time I was able to intervene and prevent that from happening. I got the sheriff's department there before it happened. But one day he disappeared and... Uh, for about 72 hours, nobody knew where he was. I didn't know that he was missing. I got a call, and I told them where to go. And they found him up on a mountain where he had shot himself in the head. You see, the law of the Lord is sound, it's healthy, it doesn't deviate, and it will restore your soul. And the word there is the same word that is used in Genesis when it talks about God breathing into man the breath of life and making him a living being. The law of God, the way he teaches us to live, will breathe into our very being the breath of his presence and bring us to fullness of life. When we turn away from that, we're turning towards destruction and death. Until we know Christ in our hearts, we exist, but we don't live. The law of the Lord restores the soul. Number two, the testimony of the Lord is sure and it makes wise the simple. I appreciate this because I'm pretty sure I'm one of those simple. People say, well, you don't sound simple. Well, trust me, in my personal life, I'm pretty simple. I like simple. I think simple. I kind of am simple. Not sure I'd say stupid, but simple. <laughs> I don't like things complex. God's witness is firm and it stands. That's what the testimony means, his witness. He alone, by the way, was here when the world was spoken into being. Did you know that? It, it was him. He was here. You and I, we, we weren't here. We didn't know. He had no third-party witnesses to what he did. He alone placed the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets in their places. 
And when he says it was this way, we can be sure that it was that way. By the way, when it says, in the beginning God created heavens and the earth, and his spirit moved upon the deep, physicists now tell us that the narrative of Genesis might be metaphorical or allegorical to some degree, but it is a very accurate description of how everything we understand came into being, because it says the waters of the deep, and they explain it this way, that all of matter only has form when it is charged electrically, I guess would be the word, when it is charged, when you have the positives and negatives and the neutrals and all of that stuff, that what holds the atoms together and makes molecules up out of atoms is a charge. And when it says the spirit hovered over the deep, the word in the Hebrew means it energized the deep. And they said the deep, the Hebrew word for deep, is kind of like a semi-solid liquid, like a slurry, like a fine powdery dust. And until God energized all of that dust so that it could come together, nothing was created. And the next step then, and physicists would agree with this, is that you take what has now been energized and from it you can make stuff. You've heard that story about the scientist saying to God, you know, we, we can create life now just like you. And he said, really? Okay, well, you do it. And the scientist grabbed up some dust and started working. And God said, wait, wait, get your own dust. That's my dust. That's just totally free, whatever you want to do with it. In the beginning, God... Satan and arrogant men have tried to remove four words from history. The first four words of Genesis. In the beginning, God. If they can take those four words out and justify removing them, then nothing else in Scripture will make sense. Without those words, nothing can stand. Nothing is sure. I was reading this article about the James Webb Space Telescope. My wife's been reading articles to me, and I've been seeing them pop up on Facebook and on, on different feeds. Have any, have any of you been looking at any of that, the James Webb Space, Deep Space Telescope? It's taking pictures of space that we've never seen before. It's opening our eyes to a whole new understanding of how vast God's creation really is. In one of the articles, the writer makes this point that we can now see billions upon billions. In fact, he said roughly over a quintillion of stars just in our system. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have enough toes and fingers to count that far. Quintillion. And that, are you ready for this? every one of those stars probably has a planetary system orbiting it. We have how many here now, depending on the day? Eight. People keep arguing about whether Pluto's really a planet or not. By the way, they now have noticed that the one thing that might be close to having a life here in our solar system besides us uh, would be the, the uh, the moon Titan that orbits around Saturn. I get lost sometimes in all of that. But these pictures show you that this telescope is showing you galaxies that are so far away that we could never ever get to them. And the writer makes this point that some of these stars that have planets orbiting around them out of these quintillion stars that we can see out there, that by the time the light from one of those stars actually gets to planet Earth, nations could have risen, flourished, and declined and disappeared millennia ago around those stars and those planets. And we will never know. And I hear that song from Stuart Hamlin. How big is God? How big and wide his vast domain? To try to tell 
my lips can only start. He's big enough to rule his mighty universe, yet small enough to live within my heart. The testimony of the Lord is overwhelming. In Isaiah 46, he writes, I am God, and there is no other like me. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. And my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. I have spoken it, and it will come to pass. How did God create everything we know about? He spoke it, and it came to pass. His testimony is sure. And when we, in our simplistic minds and in our little small world that we live in, we look at this universe that we're living in and we see the magnificence of it and the hugeness and the vastness of it and the fact that in space and time we could never ever in a million lifetimes cross any of it. (laughs) But the God of the universe the God who created all of that has chosen to make himself personally known to you and me. Making this simple person pretty wise. Number three, the precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. Precepts means God's lines and boundaries. They're straight and they're level. And they're pleasing. They are good. Now, I know at least one contractor in this room, so you'll appreciate this. (laughs) When you're building a house, starting with straight lines and a level foundation is really important. Because the further up you go in building, the more difficult it becomes if you didn't start straight and level. You get strong walls and a solid foundation when you have the right precepts for living. And the heart of a homeowner will rejoice to find the walls straight, the doors and windows fitting tightly, and the foundation not flaking away and falling apart on them. See, God lays out the lines of life straight and level for us in his word. He teaches them to us in his living word through Jesus Christ, and he speaks them into our lives through the voice of the Holy Spirit working in us. Building on his precepts, building on his straight, level lines will give you a solid foundation for living. And when you need to do some additions to your life, you'll have some straight lines to follow. One of the greatest disservices we can do to our children is to not raise them in church or to let that be an option. Parents who say, oh, I don't want to influence my children's thinking. I'm just going to let them grow up and do what they want to do. You have created a chaotic. That's where the wisdom of man ends up becoming arrogance that makes him a fool. Number four, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. This doesn't refer to the Ten Commandments. This commandment refers to God's covenant. I said I was going to come back and talk to, about that a little bit. A covenant is a contract. God's contract with man. We have God's covenant, his contract with Abraham. We have God's covenant with Noah. We have God's covenant with David. We have God's covenant with the church. We have God's covenant with Moses. Throughout the Bible, God is saying to different men, different periods of time, different entities... If you, then I. If you will obey me, I will bless you. If you will follow me, I will prosper you. If you will do as I have taught, if you'll follow my commandments, I will enlighten your eyes. Why? Because his contract, his covenant is pure. Meaning there's no caveats, no loopholes, no shadiness, no backdoor deals that can be made. God's straightforward in everything he says to us. That's why when it says the soul that sins shall die, that's kind of like part of the covenant. 
Another part of the covenant, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Covenant. Something you do. Bringing about God's response to what you've done. And here's the coolest thing about it. A covenant is always designed to be between a superior and an inferior. We're the inferior in this contract. We are not capable of accomplishing these things on our own. But the good news is, is the God who's come to us through Jesus Christ, the God who's come to us through his Bible, the God who's come to us through the Holy Spirit, is saying to you and I, okay, I know you can't do this, but if you are willing to engage with me here, I'll help you get it done. If you will embrace me, then I will get it done. Feeling inadequate? It's okay. Take it to the Lord. He said, oh, you're bringing me your inadequacies. Great, let me have those. I'll work with you. We'll get you beyond this. Number five. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Proverbs 9.10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me, says the Lord, your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. In Proverbs 10.27, something similar is said. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Now, I don't know about you, but in my simple little mind, I kind of think, okay, I want to fear the Lord. Because I kind of like living. I have people tell me, oh, I'm just ready to die. Really? Okay. I, I won't say who, but my wife has a friend who's been talking about euthanasia. But when COVID hit, she isolated, put on the mask, and did everything she could to not die. I, I understand people reaching a point where they're so miserable that death seems like a positive alternative. And I'm sure that happens. Hasn't happened to me yet. I turned 71 last week, and I'm still pretty happy to be alive. People have been saying, how do you feel? And I go, God is good. <laughs> and he is. I'm so happy to still be here to cause trouble, to have fun, to love people, love my kids and grandkids and wife. Life is good. And so if the fear of the Lord improves my life and prolongs my life, I'm into it. And people go, well, fear is such a negative word. Not in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word for fear is a relational word. Now, I don't know all of you real well, and some of you probably are glad of that. <laughs> I'm glad maybe you don't know me that well. But, the first time I came in here, I kind of was, you know, went over and sat down, and, you know, kind of. But I have met some of you and talked with you, and you've greeted me, and you've actually been nice to me. Probably didn't deserve it, but you were, and I appreciate that. And I walk in now, and I, I wave to some of you, call you by name, get to visit with you, and, and uh, we have fellowship together. Now, you see, the same thing is true in our walk with the Lord. The more we know him, the more it becomes respect and honor and awe and worship and love. The less we know him, the more it is isolation and fear, discomfort. And if you really don't know him at all and are antagonistic towards him, it can be stark, craven fear. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. But it's an awesome thing to fall into the arms of a Heavenly Father that loves you. Same person. And what, Paul, what Solomon was saying is when we realize that we are under judgment and we find that fear moves us to repentance, confession of our sin, and a request for forgiveness, that begins the journey of life that takes us into this wisdom and worship of love. Many people come to Jesus out of fear. Fear of hell. Fear of dying. But if they stay, they will stay 
out of love. Because you see, the, the journey that we're on doesn't end when we say yes to Jesus. That's just the beginning. Paul said, every day I get to say yes to the Lord. Every day I get to say no to myself. Every day I get to die to myself so that I can live to God. And so way back there in David's time, he understood the fear of the Lord is clean and it lasts forever. The relationship God wants to have with you is an eternal relationship. It's not a short time. One hit and we're gone. Well. <clears throat> Number six. Some of you have been counting that down because you know it means I'm going to be about done. The judgments of the Lord are true. And they are righteous altogether. Again. Judgments. Not the way some people think of judgment. You know, it, it's, there's, there really is, uh, it, there is within Christendom, and, and it's kind of been badly taught from the pulpit. I got criticized for not preaching a hellfire and brimstone sermons years ago, and I said, I don't understand why I should tell people they're under judgment of sin. Everybody knows that already. Most of you don't need to be scared and in one of my frustrating moments, I said, look, I could preach about hell, and I can try to scare the hell out of people. But the truth is, as soon as they get over being afraid, the hell will just come right back. So, judgment here is quite different than many times we have heard it preached. It just simply means... God's boundaries. Boundaries are important. You ever try to sell a piece of property and not know where the boundary was? People don't like that. They want to know what they're getting. God has set boundaries for us. Here's your boundary. Yeah, but, but Lord, that person's boundary is over there. Yeah, I don't care. That's not your boundary. Here's where I put you. We're at that point in life where Joe and I sometimes think things might change. We live on 10 acres in Janesville, and it's up on the mountain in the pine trees, and lots of trees. I have 20 oak trees just in my front yard. And uh, sometimes I'll go out and sit on the deck in the early morning with a cup of coffee, and I'll go, wow, Lord, thank you for letting me have 10 acres to play with for a little while till you take it back. See, that's a boundary. You don't get the stuff that you get to keep forever. It's just yours for a little while. And one of God's principles, one of his boundaries is don't hold anything too tightly and don't forget that when you leave this world, you'll leave it behind. That's a boundary. That's a judgment of God. He sets those for us. It's the rule of law he puts into place. Actually, this word judgment incorporates all the ideas of government. You know, we have three branches of government. The legislative, the executive, and judicial branches of government. Well, all three of those branches are incorporated into that Hebrew word of God's judgment. God has set up a system whereby he administers the boundaries of life for us. And he has a, makes judicial decisions as to how we are to obey and what happens if we violate those boundaries. His laws for living don't change. They are true. That means they're consistent. They don't ever go away. God's position on the issues of how to live righteously and holy before him have not changed since he created Adam. Jesus said it this way. Not one single punctuation point, not one vowel point will ever be lost from God's law. The same today, yesterday, forever. His government. Here's the good news about that. 
the world we live in, things constantly change. I was talking to a person who does income taxes here a while back. And I said, you know, my, my CPA he does this with my taxes. And she looked at me and said, oh, that's interesting. I would never do it that way. I said, really? She goes, no, but that doesn't mean anything. I said, well, I've never been audited. And I hope and pray I never am. And she said, well, that doesn't surprise me. And I said, okay, well, if you wouldn't do it that way, isn't there kind of like a standard? She said, not for taxes. They're simply prevailing policies and procedures. And I went, what do you mean? She goes, well, we do your taxes, and if we don't get red flagged by the IRS, we keep doing them that way because that means they're going to buy that. She said the laws have been changed, modified, added to, revamped, nothing taken away, just more stuff added on so many times that she said most tax accountants today just follow what they call best policy and practices and hope for the best because you can find somewhere in the tax law something that will say don't do it that way, do it this way, and then you'll find somewhere else that says do it this way, not that way. I thought, I'm sure glad I'm not a CPA. <laughs> God doesn't work that way. And I'm a simple person, so I need that. It doesn't change. Righteous altogether. And it brings assurance to us in uncertain times. We live in a time where marriage is being challenged as an institution. Where gender is being challenged. Where... Uh, it, Anything that you can think of is being questioned and, and we're, we're trying to, in our arrogance, we are becoming fools and, and the old saying is, is we, we fall for everything because we stand for nothing. We've become so open-minded our brains have fallen out. Go back to God's Word. Go back to the truth that He teaches us. Go back to things like Psalm 19 where... David, in this moment of inspiration under the Holy Spirit, offers these six ideas from God that never, ever change. So we started with the sinfulness of man and how it has made him a fool. But a fool may become wise if they will submit to the Lord. God has not hidden himself from us. He shows us himself in his creation. He came in the flesh, Jesus the Christ. He speaks to us from His Holy Word through the person of the Holy Spirit. And we can know Him, and we can know His law that restores our souls, and His testimony that is sure, and His precepts that are right, and His commandments that are pure. His fear that is clean. And His judgments that are true. These are more desirable than fine gold. They're sweeter than honey. By them we are warned in keeping them, we find great reward. They give us clear vision to see when we miss the mark. And we don't have to depend on our own limitations. We turn to God and He delivers us from the ruin of willful sin and our own foolishness. God's unchanging truth will transform our lives as we learn from Him and we learn from Him. We learn of Him and from Him. We can live blameless. And David says his love will acquit us because our hearts are listening to him. And I would close with the same prayer that David prayed. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I believe the worship team has a song for us.